here he is, the, the man of the hour. Good to see you, Mike. Okay, now um, this coming hour is all about our guest, but I just want to do a quick introduction, if I may. So welcome to the first of Burns Boost sessions. It's a series of inspirational talks to give us all a midweek, midday boost, which we probably need uh, at this time of the week. Um, these sessions are a chance for us to meet, interact and, and listen to a, an inspirational speaker with something of a, a motivating story. Uh, our first speaker is something of a hero to me. Uh, grow, growing up in the Northwest in the 70s and 80s, our first speaker was, uh, well, he was an exemplar of, uh, of success with a voice as smooth as his name and he remains a symbol of some inspiration. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the one and only Mr. Mike Shaft. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Are you able to hear me, first of all? Yeah. Brilliant. Well, can I say what a pleasure it is to be here today? Um, I don't know much about Burns, so I'm hoping to find out about it. But this first part is, I believe, about me. So yes. we'll see. Um, I was born a very long time ago, I have to tell you. I was born back in the Caribbean in Grenada in 1955. I'll let you work out the numbers. <laughs> uh, by my reckoning, I'm way too old for this sort of stuff that I'm doing. So... Um, I went to school, we were lucky enough, I was lucky enough to be born into a family that were, shall we say, well-to-do. My grandfather um, had a shop on the island, everybody knew him, consequently everybody knew me and my brother. My mum worked in the shop and um, it was like that for many, many years. I came over to the UK when I was about 12, but between then and then, I went to school. The, the school in Karakou was right outside of our front door. We could wake up at nine and be there for five past, um, which was great fun. So we could pop home at lunchtime and that kind, kind of thing. But after that, I left that school, which was uh, in Hillsborough in Karakou, which is the island I'm from, and went to school in Grenada, a place called GBSS, which is a bit legendary, I have to tell you. A lot of the great names from the Caribbean went to GBSS, not me. I just happened to be there for a couple of years. I only did a couple of years because my uh, my mum, my father was in the UK and uh, he finally saved up enough money to send for us. So my mum, my brother and I came over to this country in 1968. And um, we lived, we came to a place called Denton, which is uh, part of Greater Manchester, Thameside area. And arriving in the UK, I tell you, was just crazy because we were dressed in our short, in our pants, short pants, and kind of dressed for the Caribbean because that's the way we dressed over there. Arrived at Heathrow, and my goodness, the temperature must have been minus three. It wasn't, but it felt like it. <laughs> so uh, we had an unbelievable journey coming over. We stopped off in New York, which uh, we weren't supposed to do. We don't know why we stopped off there. We were never told. We didn't leave the plane, but uh, after about an hour sitting in the plane, we took off again and arrived in the UK. Then had to get uh, a tube type transport from the airport to the centre of London. And then from there, we got a train to Manchester and then we got a taxi to our new house, which is a brand new house. And it was nothing like I'd ever seen before. And although everything you saw was new, I think that's the best way of putting it. Everything you saw was new. And um, I then went to school. My brother and I went to school at a place called Two Trees, which is in Denton. Wonderful school, had a great time there. And kind of, you know, I was okay. I, I found myself knowing things that my other pupils in my class didn't know, which quite surprised me. I assumed I'd be way behind them um, educationally. But in fact, at worst, I was the same as many of them. And in some cases, I was ahead of others, which quite surprised the people in the know, because they don't know anything about the Caribbean. 
they think we're all living in mud huts. We weren't. Um, so I enjoyed school. Uh, there was a certain amount of racism there, I have to tell you. There were four people of color in a school of 900. There was my brother and I, and then there were two mixed race kids and everybody else in the school was white. Um, so we struggled with that, a bit of that. The teachers really didn't help. They, they weren't particularly interested, but we got through it. Uh, exams wise, I did okay. Didn't break any records, did okay and left school and didn't know what I was going to do. Then my dad suggested uh, the RAF were looking for people. So I thought, wow, get a chance to fly a plane. So I went uh, to the, 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 the center in Manchester, took some tests there, passed all the tests, then left there, went into the regional in Stafford and took all the tests there and passed the tests. And at the last interview, they said they didn't think I was the sort of a person who would uh, enjoy the RAF. So I said, OK, I wouldn't fit in. That's what they said. Um, some years later, I heard from somebody who was very important in the RAF, high up, as they say. And he says, look, we just didn't really let black people in, a, in, in those days. I said, OK, you know, it happened and that's the way it is. So I went home and we, me and my dad were talking and says, have you tried the thought about the post office. So I went to the post office, passed the test for that, and I became a junior postman, which meant riding around <coughs> on a bicycle or walking, delivering telegrams, which was wonderful until you started work. And then it wasn't so wonderful. Wind, rain, whatever, you were out there delivering telegrams. I did that and it was great fun. And while doing that, I then started looking for work as a nightclub DJ. So I'd look in the papers and see who was looking for a DJ on a Sunday morning in our street. I'd put speakers outside the window and play music, just as in the films. You know, you think this is made up in the films. It's not. That's what I did. And had great fun. And I got pretty good at, you know, judging the mood of the room, shall we say. I eventually got a job at a place called Rafters. And um, <clears throat> Rafters didn't play much black music in those days but I turned up uh, there were three of us up for the job I got it in the end and I remember on the night the guy told me that I got the job his name was Jimmy he says you know something we need a name for you so he walks out goes to the club upstairs comes back down with the yellow stacks label theme from Shaft and he says that'll be your theme tune from now and we'll call you Mike Shaft. And hence the name was born. I don't tell anybody what my real name is because it's not relevant. The people who need to know it, know it. Uh, nobody else does. Um, so Rafters was great. And we were just doing so much good business there. And unfortunately, I got there one Saturday and all the people who would be in the club were outside. I got there in time to start, start playing. And they were all outside. So before going in, I went over and said, what's going on? And he said, they're not letting us in. So I went down, spoke to the manager and said, what's going on? Why are you not letting? He says, oh, it's gotten a bit too black. Um, so we, we, we want to um, not let them in tonight. I said, well, look, if you do that, I, uh, I'm afraid I can't work here. He says, oh, no, you can't carry on, carry on. I said, look, if you're not letting them in, I'm not no longer working here. They wouldn't let him in, so I left. The best story about that night, I can tell you, is this. <clears throat> it had some big glass doors, okay, wide glass doors, absolutely fabulous. And um, in those days, a glass door, the handle and the locking mechanism was on the glass. It was fitted into the glass. And the bouncer's there, he opens the door and lets people in and some, that's it. And somebody from the opposite side of the street threw a brick, which shattered this glass door. And the bouncer is stood there holding the handle and the locking mechanism. And that's a picture I will never ever forget in my life. I left there, went to various other clubs. Clubbing was a wonderful time in Manchester. Uh, Pips, Rafters, Tropicana, 
went as far as video tech in Sheffield, worked as far as the Northeast, had a great time, continued to work for the post office. When I stopped being a junior postman, they said, right, you can be a postman now. I says, I have no interest in being a postman, sorry. So they says, have you thought about working on the counter? Now that was very attractive to me because it was not outside in the rain. I applied for that, got it, passed all the tests and got that. And I did a number of years working for the post office on the counter. Great fun, absolutely brilliant, met a lot of people. And the kind of thing you, you met though, people who would come and post something for instance. And this guy used to come in regularly posting what to me was obviously seven inch singles. I recognize, recognize the size of it and the, and the padding. So I said, we got talking and he says, yeah, he, he's in the music business. He runs a, a, a nightclub called The Pendulum, which was at playing Northern Soul. Why don't you come down, he says. So I went down there, absolutely loved it. That's where I met a good pal of mine, Richard Serling, legend of this parish. And I, I actually started working for him on the cloakroom there, which was great fun again. Got to meet everybody, heard the music, didn't like an awful lot of it. I'll tell you that for nothing, but heard some great songs there continued looking for a job, got into rafters and started playing the music I liked. When they eventually left at rafters, I then went to Pips, I think it was. Now Pips was an amazing nightclub in Manchester. <clears throat> Pips arrived from nowhere and the adverts were on the television and they said Pips number one in Europe. Couldn't believe it. <clears throat> I went to see the boss. He says, okay, let me uh, demo a bit. And said, yeah, we'd like you to, to come and they had four rooms there. And he said, we'd like you to do the commercial soul room. Well, that was just perfect for me. We didn't even discuss money. Believe it or not, we did not discuss money. I didn't know what I was going to get paid by pips until I got my first pay pack at the end of the two nights I did every week. And it had 12 pounds in the envelope, six pounds a night. In those days... I was working at the post office for 10 pounds a week, the equivalent of 10 pounds a week. I was over the moon to put it mildly. And I knew I'd found the place I wanted to be. And it was absolutely fabulous. I stayed there for years, <clears throat> eventually left to go to another nightclub and so on. And then I started working in places because people would book me because I brought a crowd. I brought a black crowd. I then we used to get coaches coming in from all over the place, coaches from the northeast coming down and uh, come into my events. And then they would go back to a nightclub in their area and says, man, you've got to book Mike Shaft, man. It's absolutely rocking. And that's how I built up my reputation in this area. In 1974, uh, the authorities allowed commercial radio to begin. It was slightly before that. The first one was in London. Uh, Piccadilly Radio in Manchester. And you that's how you, you call it, by the way. It wasn't Radio Piccadilly not Radio London Radio, this, that, or the other. It was Piccadilly Radio. They launched in 74. I tried to get in there. I didn't, no matter how I tried, couldn't get a job. Then in 78, Andy Peebles, who was doing a soul show there and who I, I knew from the first show I heard of his, I would never work there while Andy Peebles was there because his show was simply magnificent. Didn't play as much disco music as I like, but everything else was perfect. Bobby Womack and Stevie Wonder and Marv, Mar Martin, um, Marv, Marvin Gaye, those kinds of people. That's what he played. That's what I wanted to play. So I'm at the post office in West Didsbury and I opened the Daily Mail one day and it said, Peebles goes to Radio One. I didn't even read the rest of the story, I don't think. I rushed in and went to see my boss. I said, listen, can I have an early lunch? He said, yes. Within 20 minutes, I was in the reception at Piccadilly Radio. I asked to see Colin Walters, who was the boss and who everybody knew as being the boss. Uh, the people on the reception said he's not in. I said, can I see his assistant then? This lovely lady came out, Gail lovely lady and I bent her ear for about 45 minutes I kid you not in the end I think she would say anything to get rid of me so she says send in a demo tape I says Gail I've sent him demo tapes before he doesn't listen to them she says I'll make you a deal send a tape to me and I will guarantee he listens to it 
I says, that's good enough for me. I knew if I'd got the chance for Colin to hear me that I'd get the job. It was that simple. Um, I'd been working and doing my DJ and I got this, uh, this gig in, in a shopping center, shopping area. It wasn't what, like what a shopping center is now. It was the market center in Manchester and all these small individual shops selling clothing and belts. And, and I went there, I said, listen, have you ever thought about having some music here on a Saturday? So they agreed, they paid a pound each, which added up to like 25 pounds. Couldn't believe it again. And I'd just sit there and play music all day on a Saturday. Any music I wanted, played lots of uh, soft rock from America, the Eagles and that kind of stuff. So I knew the basics of radio presenting. A friend of mine, I got in touch with him. We made a demo tape, uh, went to another friend who could edit it because I had no editing facilities. He could edit it. He edited it down to about seven or eight minutes. It sounded very good. And I thought, if this doesn't get me a job, then I'm not going to get a job on the radio because this is how I want it to sound. And I was very happy with the sound. Sent it in to Piccadilly. I also sent it to Radio Merseyside, where I'd done a couple of guest spots on the soul show they had there. And I sent one to Radio One because they were starting a soul show or a dance music show on a Saturday night called Discovating. Two days later, I got a letter back from Radio One, I think was the first one. It said, please phone my secretary for an appointment. I thought, hello. A day later, I get two letters back, one from Radio Merseyside saying, thank you very much indeed, but we're not interested. And one from Piccadilly, which said, phone my secretary for an appointment. Well, I was walking about on air, I have to tell you. Lots and lots of interviews. One day I'd be at Piccadilly, the next day I'd be at Radio One. I told Radio One about Piccadilly. I didn't tell Piccadilly about Radio One. In the end, Radio One offers me a job to be on this discovating show, which was going to follow Andy Peebles on a Saturday night network right across the country. Now, what was happening before that, and this is important, is that they simulcast, as it's called now, they just put out the same thing on radios one and two in the evening. They then decided that they were going to split and Radio 1 would have its own programming. Radio 2 would have its own programming. On a Saturday night, they were going to have this Andy Peebles with a soft rock show, followed by somebody with a discovating show. And that somebody was going to be me. I could not believe it. I was in heaven. I tell you that for nothing. On the Thursday before the show is due to start on the Saturday, I'm now at a post office in Withenshaw doing my job there. And the phone rings and somebody said, Mike, it's for you. And it's the boss, the producer from Radio One. And I said to him before he said, he said it who it was. I said to him, it's not happening, is it? He says, no, it's not. I said, is it anything to do with me? He says, it's absolutely nothing to do with you. The unions weren't happy with the arrangements for the split between radios one and two. And they says, right, you're not going to be allowed to do it. You have no staff. So it didn't happen. So I put the phone down for him. I'm absolutely devastated. This is a Thursday, as I say, before the show was supposed to happen on the Saturday. Within 15 minutes, the phone rings again. Mike, it's for you. And it's Colin Walters at Piccadilly. He says, you know, we're still interested in you, Mike, don't you? I says, no, I didn't. You stopped calling. He says, oh, don't worry about it. We're still interested. And he says, why don't you come in and see me? We agree I'd go in and see him on the Friday and I'd get there somewhere around five o'clock, which was great. <clears throat> on the Friday, I get to the reception at Piccadilly. Colin Walters comes and collects me and we're walking to his office. On his way to the office, he says, would you like a drink? Now, I've been in, in the Pic Piccadilly studios a number of times because I've been in there to make demo tapes. And he says, would you like a drink? I says, I'll have a hot chocolate. And then we're walking into his office. And as we enter the door to his office, he says, when do you want to start? This Sunday, okay? I said, yeah. I did my first show that Sunday. And without being immodest, I was magnificent. 
And the reason for that is, I can promise you, this was the reason I was magnificent, because I was terrified. And everything I said, I'd spent so much time thinking about it. It was awesome. My second show was rubbish because I thought I'd arrived and I could do anything I want. I couldn't. I listened back to it and I was embarrassed. I eventually found my voice and how I wanted to sound. And I was at Piccadilly for a good few weeks. Get called in to see Colin Walters. And he says, it's going really well, Mike. We're getting some good feedback. I'd like to offer you a six month contract. I said, okay, that's great. Signed up for six months. A day later, the producer from Radio One calls and says, we are starting with the split and we want you to do the show. And I said, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I can't do it. I've just signed with Piccadilly. He says, okay then. And that was the end of the conversation with him. What I found interesting was that Colin, who'd never talked about a contract, offered me this contract within hours of the problem at Radio 1 being resolved. And I think he knew that it had been resolved and that I would go because Radio 1 was by far the more important station. I say that now and I'll put a question mark after it. I'll come to that later. Um, so I stayed at Piccadilly. I, in the end, I worked there for eight years eight years absolutely awesome my show was just hot to put it mildly and i left piccadilly in a very odd situation i was head of music for part of the time there and i got this album or it may well have been a single or an album whichever it was by whitney houston and the single saving all my love for you and I thought it was one of the most magnificent pieces of music I'd ever heard. It came out probably late summer of whatever year it was. And I predicted on the Soul Show, this was going to be the number one record in this country at Christmas. Right off the first time I heard it. Number one record in the pop charts at Christmas, I said. And it, uh, we, it start, entered the lower reaches of the charts. And we went through uh, November into December. And it's rising up through the charts. Now, I'll have to tell you this bit before I get to the story. In those days, there was a chart for Radio 1, which is the national chart, and independent radio, the Piccadillys and Capital Radios of this world, ran their own chart. And that chart was mailed, or, or it wasn't mailed, it was actually, um, it wasn't, there were no things as email then. Um, it was sent by fax. So it was faxed to the station and then broadcast on a Friday and broadcast live on a Sunday. On the Friday, the chart came up from Independent Radio, the Independent Radio chart. And the number one single for Christmas of that year was Whitney Houston. I was so excited, you wouldn't believe. I couldn't wait to do my show on Sunday evening. I get in to do my show and I'm preceded by the chart show. And the chart show gets to number three, plays whatever that was, gets to number two and plays Whitney Houston. Gets to number one and plays, uh, 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 the name will come to me in a minute. And I am mad as hell. If this was the way it was and that that show, that, that song was number one. Why did the chart say that song was number two and Whitney Houston was number one when it came up on the, the text or the, uh, on, on the Friday? So <clears throat> it's my show coming up immediately after the chart show. And I'm in the studio. I listen to this ridiculous piece of music, which is number one, and it's not Whitney Houston. And the newsreader comes in, reads the news, and I put my first piece of music on for my show, and I'm crying my eyes out. Crying my eyes out. Gets to the end of that song, I put the next song on without saying anything. Gets to the end of that song, I put the next song on without saying anything. The red phone rings, Colin Walters, what's going on? Why are you not talking? And I told him, I can't work here anymore. I can't work here anymore. This, this, this place has no integrity. 
the chart came up and he says, look, come in and talk to me on Monday morning. I go in and talk to him and explain to him. And I said, look, I'm really sorry, but I just can't work here anymore. And I left Piccadilly just like that. A few days later, Radio Manchester gives me a call. It's the producer of the Phil Sayer show. Phil Sayer was the lunchtime presenter. And they wanted to talk to me about the fact that the government were allowing some community radio stations, as they were called back then. I go in and have a wonderful chat to Phil Sayer. And he says to me, you've left Piccadilly, haven't you? I said, yes, I have. What are you going to do now? He says, I says, I might go and talk to your boss and see if he wants a soul show here at Radio Manchester. We finished the interview. I opened the door to leave and his boss is stood there. Come and talk to me, he said. Come and talk to me. That was, I don't know what day in the week that was. However, I'll tell you this. On that Saturday night, I did my first soul show at Radio Manchester. Did that for a couple of years. Absolutely, absolutely brilliant. While doing that, and <laughs> I haven't said this before, I'll say it now. I honestly believe God looks after me. OK, because some of the stuff I've done, you would have to admit I'm an absolute genius if it wasn't for somebody planning this somewhere. I happen to think that's God. I do my Piccadilly radio show. A new TV program launches from Manchester called Open Air. So uh, I'm looking at it and uh, it's an all white cast and um, so on and so forth. And they got me in as a guest to talk about the lack of black people on television. I said, I, I'll, I'll come and do it. But the only person I'd speak to was the director general. Wasn't it interested in speaking to anybody else. They says, oh, he'll never come on here. Don't worry. So uh, we'll just leave it. I said, that's fine. So I'm doing my a week, a weekly show, a daily show, in fact, at this point at Piccadilly, at, at Radio Manchester. <clears throat> and the producer from Open Air comes in one day and says, the director general says he'll do it. I says, I'd be delighted to do it. And we sat down live on Open Air, national BBC television at breakfast time. And I absolutely destroyed the poor man. They, they really didn't have a, an answer to any of my questions. I finished the interview and disappeared back to Piccadilly. I met the producer uh, on the way. He was very happy with it. I then get a call from the producer about three or four weeks later saying they're looking for some researchers and they'd like me to apply. I go for the interview and they say, why do you want to be a researcher? I said, I don't want to be a researcher. I want to be a presenter. But if this is the way we've got to go through it, let's do it. We do the interview. I get the job on open air. Wonderful time. Great guests. Great stories. And I'll skip by now 25 years. I'll go back and pick up the timeline in a minute. <clears throat> 25 years later. We're having an open air reunion. It had been off the air many, many years. An open air reunion in Manchester. And the producer, in fact, he's more than a producer, the uh, series editor, tells a story of me getting my job at open air. So everybody's sitting in this room and he says, and Mike was a guest on the show. And at the end of it, the director general made a beeline for this series editor, Mr. Vile, as he's called. And he was terrified about what the, uh, the director general was going to say to him because I did make him look bad. I did make the organization look bad. And the director general walks into the show, into his office and says he was in brilliant, that guy. Get him on the show. The swear word I left out. And that's when they invited me to come and be um, be a researcher. I said I didn't want to be a researcher. I wanted to be a presenter. And I got a job as a presenter. I was working at Radio Manchester during the day, working at uh, on, on open air network television in the mornings before I went and did my afternoon show. 
I was so rich, it was ridiculous. So these things happen to me, as I say, you know, I can only thank God for it because I think he's, he's been looking after me. I'm doing my shows at Radio Manchester. And there is an announcement by the IBA, I think it was then, the Independent Broadcasting Association, which went on to be the Radio Authority, which went on to be Ofcom, etc. And they send out a press release saying that they're going to allow incremental radio stations across the country. These were smaller than the uh, Piccadilly radio and capital size, and they would be within a very small area, within other broadcast areas. So I uh, put together a group, applied for, and this didn't happen as quickly as it's going to sound. But in the, in the end, we got it. Sunset Radio was going to be a black music station, community station in the evening between 7 and 11, and then the wickedest dance music station from then on through the night. We applied for it. People liked the concept, uh, got a nice team together applied for it, got it, and set up Sunset Radio. I can tell, the thing I can tell you about Sunset, with, I, I could sit here all day and talk about Sunset, and you wouldn't believe how good it was. One of the coolest magazines in the area was a magazine called City Life. <clears throat> and City Life did a write-up about Sunset Radio. And the line that stood out for me was this, Sunset is by far the most interesting radio station in Manchester. I will never forget that line if I live to be a million. By far the most interesting radio station in Manchester. Sunset lasted about three years in total. I think I lasted about 18 months before financial difficulties struck. We had a director who ran Radio City in Liverpool. He said, I remember the meeting. He said, uh, we need to find more funds. Radio City will happily put in more funds, but only if Mike Shaft is no longer the managing director. They had a vote, and at that point, I was removed as managing director and left in tears. I then um, bumped around for a while, did bits of stuff here, there, and everywhere. A few weeks later, Radio City had pulled out of Sunset Radio. And the people at Sunset asked me to come back. I said, I didn't want to be in charge. They said, come back as a <clears throat> head of promotions. I said, yep, that'd be great. Head of promotions was awesome because I had all of, pick of, of Sunset Radio at my disposal. I could do any deal I wanted to. We had some of the coolest uh, presenter cards, because I did a deal with a printer, didn't cost us a penny. They wanted to be on the air. This was their way to be on the air. It just worked out so well. We did a gig. We did lots of gigs that were okay. We did a gig at the biggest nightclub in the center of Manchester. 21 Piccadilly, it was called. And it had a capacity of about 2,500. I can tell you, we sold over 3,000 tickets, 3,000 tickets. It was called the Easter Bash. The station made an absolute fortune. I, I don't know what this, the uh, people from the council would have thought of the number of people we had in, but never any comeback. And the station then continued until I said, I didn't want to work there anymore <clears throat> and left. And about, I don't know, maybe three, four, five, six months later, the station was gone. It ran out of money. Um, the guy who said he would fund it wasn't in a position to, and, and it went off the air. A friend of mine, Julian Allett, he's a friend now. I didn't know him a lot then. He ran Piccadilly at one point in time. And Mike Briscoe was the uh, head of programs, I think. Uh, when I left, Radio Manchester, I got a call from Mike Briscoe saying, come and do some shows for us, will you? Um, so I went there. They just split frequencies and had a thing called Key 103 as well as Piccadilly 1152. I did some shows on Key 103, which was just wonderful. They played awesome. And I mean 
awesome soft rock music from the States mainly. And it was a quality station. Their jingle package, music, not music, was the, the strap line. 99% of people hated it. I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. The station didn't last that long as Key 103 uh, because management made changes. It didn't take off as they thought it would as a concept. They changed the jingle package and got some new presenters and, and so on and so forth. So that's my early years in radio. And I've been about radio all the time. In the meantime, doing other stuff as well. My big passion is basketball. While working at the, at the radio stations, I used to commentate for Manchester Giants. How did I get into basketball? A very good friend of mine, Robert, Robert Finlayson, he's called. We lived within five minutes drive of each other. And uh, Robert commentated for Manchester Giants. And I say commentated, I'll put that in inverted commas. He said to me one day, why don't you come down to the basketball? I said, do they have basketball over here? He says, yeah, come down. So we go down and it's wonderful. It's the first time I see basketball in this country. They weren't allowed to commentate. They were announcers according to the rules. They could say the name of the person who committed the foul or scored the points. And that was about it. Started the game, few men mentions, and then the end of the game. One day, and that was at Stretford Sports Centre, I first saw them. One day, they're now playing at Altrincham Sports Centre. And Robert and I, I used to stand with him, are standing on the balcony. He's commentating. And this game is awesome. Seriously awesome. Exciting doesn't do it justice. And Robert is there. Foul called on Trevor Brookins. Foul called on John Morehouse. And I'm standing there. I said, Robert, punch it up a bit, man. Give it some. He says, I'm not allowed to. I said, Robert, give me that microphone. And I took the microphone off him and I funked it up a bit. Oh my goodness, it was awesome. By the end of the game, the whole place was jumping. At that point, all hell broke loose because the visitors lost the game and it was my fault. We had a commissioner in those days who sat on the table and was in charge of the uh, of the, the game. He was appalled. Va fans of the visiting team were appalled. In the end, we all went home. We get there for the next game, and there were now two microphones there because the one guy who wasn't appalled was the guy who owned the team. He was called Amir Madani. And he owned the team. He thought it was wonderful. He told his managing, uh, the guy who ran the team, the GM, um, John Dabrowski, I think he was called, to uh, put two microphones up there. And from then on, one was mine, one was Robert. Robert did his laid back stuff and I whooped it up and the fans loved it. And from that day on, I've been doing basketball commentary. And to this day, I still do basketball commentary. I work for two teams. I work for Cheshire Phoenix and for Sheffield Sharks. And I'm the in-house commentator at Stroke Announcer. So I introduce the teams. I'm allowed to do play-by-play. -play. The only thing I'm not allowed to do is to criticize the officials. So I don't criticize the officials. I just do it in my way. Um, but I get away with quite a bit. When um, we got into the lockdowns and everything was shut down, basketball disappeared along with everything else. They then came to an agreement with the authorities that basketball could restart, but there was to be no crowd. So I was terrified now because the game was coming back. There was no need for me. Um, so I just wondered what I'd do. I get a phone call from the boss, uh, Sarah, who runs the Sharks, and she says, I want you to do the TV side of it because they have a TV broadcast of the game. So they sat down their guy and says, look, you know, we want Mike to do this. I did it. I'm still doing it. It's absolutely wonderful. Cheshire Phoenix offered me the same thing. And I do that for them as well. I have a great fun with basketball. I love basketball. And I think it's finally going to take off in a big, big way. Because back in the day, um, when I was at the height of my broadcasting career, shall we say, um, Sky, who was coming on the air, said, uh, 
we're doing some basketball. We think, I've been told is what the guy says, you're the person to talk to. I was working at the Bay in Lancaster. Uh, Mr. Allett, who I see on the screen in front of me, he was the boss. And I get a phone call and somebody says, this is blah, 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 uh, from Sky. And I'm told you're the man to talk to about basketball. I says, who's taking the mickey here? He says, this is such and such from Sky. We're starting basketball and we're interested in you. I said, okay. He says, I want you in my office tomorrow by about midday. I rush in to see Colin, um, Julian Allett. I says, listen, I've got a chance to go working for Sky. They want to see me tomorrow. He gives me the day off on the spot. And uh, I go down there. The guy isn't there. I think we're meeting at 12, 12 o'clock. He's not there. Half 12, he's not there. He struts in at one o'clock. The meeting lasts, I, I kid you not, about five minutes. And he says, right, that's fine. Um, he says, you're excited about this, aren't you? I said, just a bit. He says, are you excited enough to do it for no pay? I says, no, I'm not. He shouted out a figure. We agreed on it. And that was it. I did three and a half years broadcasting on Sky Sports basketball. I mean, I'm, I'm just in heaven. I, it doesn't get much better than that for me. And I've been lucky in my life, or God's been looking after me, that I get to do what I like. I vowed I would not do stuff that I did not enjoy. So radio, DJing in nightclubs, and now basketball with the crowd and basketball on Sky. The Sky gig lasted three and a half years and they said, thanks very much. Uh, we're thinking about going a different way. I said, that's absolutely fine. Three and a half years that I couldn't believe how wonderful they were. At present, I'm working for BBC Radio Manchester again. We went to, through a name change, a couple of name changes. I do the Sunday breakfast program there each and every Sunday. I wake up at 4.30, I'm at the studio for five. I live three minutes drive away from the studio and we go on the air at six. We have an hour long gospel music program. And even that, how that came along was very, very strange because I was doing the show, um, two hour show, seven till nine. And there was somebody else doing the gospel music show and it wasn't very good. It just wasn't. Um, and I had to I talk to God about it. I said, I could do a better job than that for you. And in the end, I got the job. There and then got the job. They said, uh, we'd like you to take over the gospel show. So now I pick all the music for the gospel show. I pick all the music for the show for the hour after that. And the station picks the, the next two hours. And it is great fun. It's a religious program and we make no excuses for that. Uh, that's what the BBC want at that time on a Sunday. All of the local radio stations have one of those and it is just an absolute joy. And I still can't believe sometimes that I get to pay, I get paid to do the things that I love doing. The future, well, heaven only knows what the future holds because things are changing so fast. I launched my own radio station at one point online. Um, there's no money to be made. And when I ran out of money, I just said, well, that's it. I'll close it down. So I closed it down. There are lots of uh, live gigs that I do. I do a variety of things, hosting conferences and the like. A uh, friend of mine, David, I worked with him for a different company. He then left that company and set up his own company and booked me as their main presenter for years. Their main event was an award ceremony. And I did that for them for 10 years. So it's, uh, it's, it's a crazy life that I've led, I've lived, and it gets crazier by the day because things change. I, uh, one of the guys I had working for me at Sunset Radio, there was a team of them called the Dream Team, Duncan Smith, who's no longer alive, and um, Mr. Quirk, Steve Quirk. Steve works for a station in London called Colourful Radio. Colourful Radio is a cool radio station, plays black music, black news. Well, the news is, is a fairly straightforward news, but the talk is, is black community. And they got in touch with Steve and said they wanted a drive time show. Four till six every day. Uh, they didn't do live programs, although they've got pro, uh, studios in London. And uh, they called me. 
Steve suggested me, they called me, we had a chat, agreed a fee, and I do a daily show for them. From my studio where I'm sitting now, I record a two hour program. I put it into a thing called Dropbox. They collect it from there and it goes out four till six in the evening. And after a few weeks on the air, I suggested to, to the, the boss that there's no reason why this show can't go out four till six a.m. as well. I had to rejig some of what I said. I uh, couldn't talk about afternoons or mornings because the same show went out in both. So I don't talk about the time. It's four till six a.m. and p.m. And that's how it's tagged. And the show's going really well. The money's okay. I wish they would up it a bit, but hey ho, who knows when. So we'll see how long that lasts. They recently started broadcasting. They were online only. They uh, recently started broadcasting on DAB in London and hoping to spread that across the country. I'm in talks with a, a group to try and set up a new radio station in Manchester. We'll see how that goes. I don't know how much I can say about it, so I won't say any more than that. If, it's, if it happens, it will feature Manchester music, all the great Manchester music, pretty much round the clock. And presenters will be there sometimes live, sometimes recorded. It's a most interesting time in the industry. And what I find fascinating is it hasn't changed much from the way it was. I saw a photo which was in one of the papers the other day of Radio One of their presenters. And there must have been 20, maybe 25 people in the photo. And there was one person mixed race and one person black. And this was back then. And while it's gotten a bit better, it hasn't really improved, which is really, really disappointing. We do now have stations like Colourful, which is a mainly a black cast, shall we say. And we do the, the radio in the way we want to do it for the people we think we want to listen to it. And it seems to be working. I wish that some of the, uh, the bigger radio stations will understand that. There are people out there who like different things. We don't all want the same 200 songs over and over and over again. Will it change? I really don't know if it'll change, but we'll see. There are opportunities now online where you don't need huge sums of money like you did back in the day. And with a bit of creativity, you can put out a really exciting radio station. And that's where I am now. Um, I don't know if it, do we have the facility for questions? Do, do we know? Yeah, absolutely. If, uh, if people want to unmute their mics and just, um, you know, uh, ask a question, they can do that right now if they'd like to. Excellent. Are there, so, are there any questions at all for Mike? Okay, they may be a little shy, so I'll, I'll ask a question. Okay. I think that's all right. Uh, so, keeping the dream alive. Uh, I noticed that you had um, Lisa Stansfield sing it as a jingle for Sunset. Uh, this talk was entitled Keeping the Dream Alive. I just wondered, what, what did that mean to you? What does it mean to you? Well, what it means to me is what Martin Luther King said, you know, keeping the dream alive, the dream that people will be judged on the content of their character not by the color of their skin. And this is back in 67, 68, he made these speeches. And here we are now, still people being judged by the color of their skin. And it's a shocking situation. And at sunset, when I set sun sunset up, I wanted something which encompassed that dream. And that's why I took the line from that speech, uh, keeping the dream alive. When we went to make the jingles, I got to tell you this story. Radio stations get jingles Then We have a jingles package, as it's called. And you get, you go to a company and they write the jingles and you sit down, you tell them what you want to say. They say, it, they put the music to it. They get some of their people to sing it and that's it. So I go and see a guy in Stockport to have the jingles made for Sunset. And he says, uh, we've got a great singer and she'll be great doing this. I says, no, I know who I want to do the jingles. It's Lisa Stansfield. He says, oh, <laughs> you're not going to get Lisa Stansfield to sing your jingles. I said, okay, leave it with me. I knew Lisa because when I was on Piccadilly, Lisa's team came to the door at Piccadilly with a 12-inch single and says, 
to the people who answered the door, this is for Mike Shaft. We hope he'll play it. I was on the air at the time. They knew when to come. I listened to it and immediately played it. It was a track called Big Thing. And if you ever get a chance to listen to Big Thing, please do. Because when they were in the studio, and I was told this, all they wanted to do was make a track that Mike Shaft would play on Piccadilly. That was all they wanted to do. A song, a track that Mike Shaft would play on Piccadilly. They brought it in. I absolutely loved it. Played it and played it. Lisa then starts to build her profile. There's a guy in London. Um, let me see if I remember his name. It'll come to me. Um, top DJ. Absolutely wonderful guy. Hugely overweight. He won't mind me telling you that. Hugely overweight. He went to do a gig in Spain somewhere. Had an accident. Uh, broke, badly damaged his leg. And um, the hospital said, look, at your weight, having the anesthetic and then the, the, the repair job, it could kill you. It's either that or in, you're in a wheelchair. He says, I don't want to be in a wheelchair. He had the uh, operation and didn't survive it. And all the DJs who knew him, Steve, 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 that's his first name. Um, we did an event in London to, you know, give thanks for his life. And I'm stood at the bar and this tiny little lady, she's about, I don't know, five feet something four feet something comes up and taps me on the shoulder and she says you played our first record i said why who are you she says i'm lisa stansfield and i went oh lisa how lovely to meet you and blah 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 so lisa kind of owes me but uh, <laughs> never mind so i write to lisa's record company and say we want lisa to sing our jingles and they come back and they, I think what they wanted to say was, don't be so ridiculous. They said it nicely. I'm in Stockport at a studio talking to the guy about the jingles. Somebody, one of the secretaries from the other recording studio, Strawberry Studio, legendary studio, comes over to the studio I'm at to borrow a roll of fax paper. You couldn't make this stuff up, honestly. So she says, you'll never guess who's in our studio, Lisa Stansfield. I thought, right. So I go across to the other studio. It's only about three minutes walk. And I said, Lisa, how are you? Hey, Mike. I, I says, what's this about you not singing my jingles? She says, oh, yeah, the record company mentioned it to me, but they said it was a pirate radio station. I said, Lisa, it's not a pirate radio station. We've got permission from the broadcasting authorities to do this station. It's going to be Manchester. It's going to be black music all day. And she says, oh, yeah, I'll do it. No problem. Uh, get in touch with the company again. This time they said, yes, Lisa came, sung our jingles. The guy who wrote the jingles was wonderful. He knew exactly what I wanted to say. And that jingle package is pretty legendary in local radio. Um, and that was based on keeping the dream alive. And if I knew I was going to talk about that, I'd hook this up so I could play it to you. <laughs> Maybe I will. So uh, Lisa came in, did a wonderful job with the jingles. And I, I won't say we're friends, but she knows who I am. Let's put it that way. And she knows that I'm the first person to play their music. And the week that we launched Sunset 1989, the number one song in the country, in the pop charts, was Lisa Stansfield all around the world. And we asked her to come in and do a, a, for an interview. She came in, spent, I think, maybe about an hour and a half with me. And it was just wonderful. And she, she loved the music. She loved black music. And it was awesome. There's just no other word for it. And it was that kind of thing that we built with Sunset. It, it had, how would one put this? It was very well respected in all walks of life. Uh, City Life magazine, and I still quote this now on my website, said, 
Sunset is by far the most interesting radio station on the dial. This is us while, you know, there are all these big budget stations, Radio Manchester, Piccadilly, Radio Key 103 now, and tons of other stations in this area. And the coolest magazine of the time said, Sunset is by far the most interesting radio station in the city. And to be honest, I couldn't, couldn't uh, feel any better about it. So the dream always was that people would be judged by the contents of their character, not by the color of their skin. And that's Martin Luther King's dream. And if I had a dream, it would be that as well. And there, there are people with an awful lot of talent who don't get anywhere because of the color of their skin. That is wrong. It's wrong. And the opposite of that is there are some people who get jobs who aren't half decent, you know, they mediocre, but they get the job because of the color of their skin. So that's the history of me and Sunset and Jingles and the like. Super. Thank you so much. Uh, I see that uh, in the chat we've got a little something from... Yeah. Prof. Danny, have you seen that? Yes, I can. I'm just reading it. Can't wait to tell my son, my son, stepson, who's now at college studying music. He specializes in R&B. He's already overcome so many obstacles and is producing beats and tracks for local artists. I'll be dropping your name in a conversation with him tonight. <laughs> Feel free to drop my name in the conversation. Um, I, uh, I, I get invited to lots of, uh, you know, speaking events. Most of them are on Zoom now, of course, uh, but in the days when we did lives and people ask me, you know, how do you, how do you look on the whole thing? What do you think of the media at the moment? And there are a lot more radio stations now. There are lots of specialist radio stations. In the, back in the old days, there weren't any. That's why Piccadilly had a three-hour soul show once a week. Uh, station in London, Capital, had a three-hour show with Greg Edwards and different stations around the country. That's all changed now, thankfully, because there is more media. But as for choice at the top level, there is no choice at the top level. It's absolutely shocking. Um, the, the top radio stations in the country, the network radio stations, still play, you know, 300 songs over and over and over all the things that other people turned into hits uh, that's what they play and loads of people now if they want black music or specialist music have to either do their own stations or go on the internet and listen to stations from the states or elsewhere there are a few half decent black music stations in this country usually just online and i can live with that you know but i see no reason and i made this argument many many years ago and it was never taken up. I see no reason why there shouldn't be a black music station nationally in the UK. We, we, that was the original dream when we started talking about Sunset. In the end, they said they would allow local radio stations. We applied for it and won it. Um, and that's how Sunset came into being. But to this day, I see no reason why there isn't a national broadcasting on your radio black music show station. I would agree with that. It's 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 way past time, way past time. Mm. Um, I think we've just got one time for one final question. This is from Maria. Can you see that uh, question there, Mike? Um, can I see Maria? Let me see. I have to scroll down. No, I the one I see is uh, from Dean. Uh, it says, "Hi, Mike. Do you remember being MC on my Three Degrees Night in Horton Green? You also did me a jingle." <coughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, it's, uh, I get invited to do loads and loads of gigs. More often than not, I can't do them because I'm doing something else. I do basketball commentary, still doing it after all these years. And I think it was 1970 something uh, when I did my first gig with my mate Robert and I grabbed the microphone off him and uh, took over the commentary. And I still do it now. I work for two teams now, one in, in Cheshire and one in Sheffield. And they're both fairly successful teams. Um, I did get invited. I get invited to do lots of music gigs. I don't do many of them. I say thanks, but you know, I'm not interested. Um, somebody got in touch with me and wanted to me to do their three degrees gig, which was happening in Horton Green. Horton Green is very special to me because 
I'd never even heard of it until I went to school there. Because when we came to this country, we lived in Denton and Horton Green is right next to Denton. The school that I went to was in Horton Green. And that night with three degrees was just wonderful because this place was, to say it's tiny is, is putting it mildly. I don't think you could have got 200 people in there. Um, I was DJing that night and uh, playing music and introducing him on stage. And to see the three degrees up close and personal was just astonishing in Horton Green yeah. in Denton next awesome great night truly great night so uh I I've been lucky in my life to uh be involved with so much with radio with basketball with different types of sport I come and take netball uh for the Manchester team when they when they're playing in this area and I I'm just going to carry on as long you know as God wants me to and then when he's done with me, I'll go wherever he wants me to. I, I've had I've had a wonderful life, to put it mildly, as the song says. Excellent. And that just ties into this final question from Maria. Uh, she says, you've had an interesting career and you're clearly resilient. How do you handle the setbacks and has your approach changed at all over the years? My approach, I don't think, has changed much. I've always been a cocky so-and-so um if you don't want me that's fine i'll go to somebody who does i know whose loss it is mm. i've been lucky to always have had something to say when i got the job at piccadilly i mean i told you how i got the job at piccadilly yeah. um i did their black music show for eight years i think it was um and then left as i told you um over this nonsense and immediately went to Radio Manchester, did shows there. And I've always been doing shows, um, specialist shows and then ordinary shows, shall we call them. And now I work for Radio Manchester, do Sunday breakfast there, uh, each and every Sunday morning. I've mentioned that before. And then I work on, on Colourful Radio, a daily show. It's a quarter past one now, at four o'clock I'll be on there. Um, I've been very lucky, but when given a chance, I've grabbed it with both hands. There are people who, give, who get a chance and don't, don't manage to grab it. And I have. And I don't know how long it's all going to last. You know, I, I am no longer young. Um, so we'll see how long it lasts. Uh, there are ideas floating about for new, new things, new stations. Um, there's a group I'm involved with. We'll see if it comes off. I don't know how much more I can say about it than that. Um, but... I've been lucky. God's been looking after me. That's that's what I believe. Because some of the things I've, I've been involved in, you you couldn't make it up. You know that conversation I had on uh, to get the job on 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 the BBC on a program called Open Air. I was a guest on Open Air, and the big boss of the BBC was there. I may not mention this, and uh, he was so impressed. He said, "Give him a job." That's exactly how it happened. And I was on the on air on television with on open air for three years. I left to set sunset up. I mean, I've I've jumped over big areas of my life, as you can well imagine, because we haven't got a day to do this. But uh, I've absolutely loved it. If you get into the media, grab it with both hands if you get a chance. And if you see a gap for something, if you see a gap somewhere for something, grab it with both hands. Come up with an idea how to fill that gap and make it happen. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time today, Mike. It's very, very much appreciated. Uh, I know when I was growing up in Manchester, you were something of a hero to me. So getting a chance to talk to you is absolutely fantastic. I've really enjoyed every moment of it. And um, I'm sure I speak for, for everybody attending today when I say thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you do as well, Mike. It's very much. Well, thank you. I hope it was what you were looking for. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, just to let the, the attendees know that we'll be doing this every Wednesday lunchtime over the coming weeks. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you for your time. Mike, thank you so much for your participation. And I look forward to seeing some of you again soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much, Mike. Cheers.